Welcome to part 4 of Project E55 ASL and there's a whole bunch of steel tubes on ground in my garage right now so if you haven't already guessed it this part is going to be about making the tube steel chassis of the car well not all of it actually it's just going to be about making the center part of the tube steel chassis where the uh, driver and the passenger sit and well that is pretty much the main part of the chassis everything in front of this part and everything behind this part is going to bolt onto this middle part um, so it's a modular construction most race cars are actually going to be built this way because it actually works out better for accessing the components, everything can be bolted apart. And also structurally it works out better because you don't need to leave spaces in the chassis for installing or removing the engine or things like that. Uh, but yeah, quite a lot of work to do for this part, so let's just get right into it. Talking about the tubes that I'm going with for making this chassis, so these are the ones that I'm going for. These are DOM, or drawn over mandrel. And well, just to tell you the differences between the different types of tubes, the most common one you'll find is cold rolled electric welded or CREW, which is this one. And you can tell this by just by looking at it because you'll see a weld on one side and you'll actually even see the weld on the inside. So the way these tubes are made is that um, they start off with sheet metal and they roll these tubes into like a round tube shape and then they weld them from one side to um, close that open end. Um, so the difference between cold rolled electric welded and drawn over mandrel is that these tubes actually go through an extra step um, of drawing these tubes over a mandrel that forms the final shape of the tube. So that actually hides the weld completely so you won't be able to see a weld on this one. Um, and this one will have be of more uniform strength all across because it goes through that extra step and um, welding usually weakens the tube from one side. Um, because obviously welding, you're heating the tube and also you're changing the shape a little. Um, so that's why that extra step gives these tubes more uniform strength all across the tube. There's also one more type of seal that I don't have over here to show you guys. That's seamless tubing and seamless tubing doesn't have any welds on it. It just starts like it's a different process of making the tube. So they just make the tube from hollowing out the center part and um, that's how they form the final shape. So how do you know which one you have to go for? I guess the best answer is just to read the rule book of whatever event you're planning to compete in. So this is a global time attack rule book and this is the CSCS rule book and they both have pretty similar regulations on what seals are allowed um, so my car is going to weigh somewhere around 2,000 pounds so I'm following these regulations so the tubes should be 1.5 inches in diameter and 0.95 inches in wall thickness and DOM is actually allowed for this that's why I'm going with DOM tubes and there's actually one more thing other than this that you need to know that is the grade of steel that is used for whatever tubes you're getting so whenever you get your tubes just make sure to get a spec sheet along with them um, so this spec sheet will actually tell you everything about your steel tube like the tensile strength um, what materials actually go into making this steel and also the elasticity of the tube so how much this can stretch before it actually breaks and that's actually really important for calculating how strong your final design will be um, because well the main roll hoop and everything else like this part is pretty much all mandated by the regulations like how strong it should be but all other parts you'll actually need to do your own calculation and find out what strength is actually required for that. Now for making the chassis all the steel tubes that I ordered I did order them cut to size so they're already cut to the appropriate length that they need to be at um, so that cuts out my work quite a bit I don't need to do any cutting for that um, but I do still need to do some notching like I need to shape these ends so that they fit onto the other tubes properly and I also need to bend a few tubes so I'm going to start off by bending and notching the tubes and then I'm going to like start off by making this um, bottom part of the frame and then work my way up and make the rest of it. For bending the tubes I had this hydraulic tube bender which was actually pretty horrible like it had no degree markings or anything on it. The only accurate way I found of bending tubes with this one was just to attach a cell phone with these two magnets and using a level app and then seeing how much I was bending the tube on that app. And surprisingly that worked out pretty accurately because later when I checked these angles using the digital protractor they were pretty close. Uh, but it did take me a few attempts to get this that close because the steel does want to flex back to its original shape so you do have to bend it an extra degree or something. Now that some of the bending is sorted, next I have to get to notching these tubes. So for notching the tubes, what I've done is that I've printed out these templates. Um, so basically what I did was the way, like in the software it's pretty easy to see what shape you need to, for one tube to fit onto the other. So I flattened out these tubes in the software and I printed this out. So I'll cut this paper template and I'll stick it on the tube. Then I'll mark that shape over here and then I'll plasma cut the tube in the same shape. So this way works pretty accurately for notching tubes, especially when the notching later on is going to get difficult where there's multiple tubes joining at the same point. But there is also another way to do it, like without using any software or anything. And I'll show you that way later in the video too. After the plasma cutting was done, I just cleaned the end of the tube off with an angle grinder. That's just to get rid of all the rough edge that the plasma cutter leaves. And after that you can see that it's pretty much a perfect fit on the other tube. 
So now I've just started putting all the tubes in place for the bottom part of the frame. This is the lowest part of the frame. Everything is literally going to be built over this. Uh, so it's extremely important for this part of the frame to be extremely flat. I'm not using a jig or anything for it and the problem for me is that my concrete floor isn't exactly leveled either. So I'm just using, I've taken some time and I've put some washers and tubes at the back and um, measured everything out so everything is extremely leveled. And the difficult part for me is that this part of the frame is not even perfectly flat from underneath. It's actually slightly curved to compensate for a bigger diffuser. So by design, like I did some CFD and everything and I found out that um, if the diffuser starts early on, like if it starts somewhere around the center of the car, um, that's where like the ground effect works the best and the airflow actually stays attached underneath the diffuser. Um, so that's why um, the floor of the car is slightly sloping. So after that I just measured everything one final time and then I tack welded everything in place. Now welding things without a jig is definitely not ideal so you really have to watch out for welding warps. The only way to do it is to keep measuring as you're welding along and if something warps but the easiest thing is just to apply a thicker bead on the other corner and that way if you get a hang of that method you can warp everything back to the same place. Um, I didn't have to do that too much because luckily for this frame it didn't warp much when I was welding it. And once all the welding was done on one side, then I just flipped the frame over and did some welding on the other side. Now I'm done with welding the lower part of the frame and quite surprisingly it didn't warp at all while I was welding it. So I've put it back in the same position and I was uh, measuring the corners and also the angles and also the level. And everything is still exactly like it's flat and um, all the corners are matching up. So that's actually pretty good. And also showing you guys a closer look at the welds. So this is what the welds look like. They should be acceptable. I'll still keep uh, changing the settings on my MIG welder to try to get better welds, but it's looking pretty good. Like these welds should be strong, like the penetration and everything is fine. There are a few regulations, by the way, for welding too. Um, the rules for welding is that every weld should be 360 degrees around the tube. So it should cover the full surface where the tube is touching the other tube. And if you have um, angles where the tubes are at a really sharp angle and you can't access some point of the tube, then you need to add gussets there to re reinforce that part where you can't weld. So after that I put all the other braces in place for the lower part of the frame. And once everything was in place then I welded everything together. Now I'm done with welding the whole lower part of the frame and well the welds also got a little better as I was going along. Um, so this time they're better than before. And next what I have to do is I have to start working up from here and start building the rest of the frame. So I have to make these upright tubes that are going to come up from here. Actually I can show you that in the design. So it's um, these six tubes. So for these tubes I did the same thing, just held them in place using a magnet and then tack welded them and then measured everything a few times and then um, completed the welds. So this way did take long because I was measuring everything so many times. But in the end the tubes did line up pretty well and I wasn't left with any big welding gaps or anything so that was all pretty good. So now I've welded these uh, tubes that hold the upper part of the frame together and I've already put this tube in place but this tube isn't welded in right now, it's just um, over here. And uh, the reason I haven't welded it in right now is because I have to make these cross members and these cross members actually have to go in and then I have to put this tube on and weld it because if I weld it on right now there would be no way to put these um, cross members in there. Um, so this is a really good time to show you guys the other method of notching tubes like without using the software because I didn't print any templates for these tubes but it's easy enough to mark it anyways. So for knowing how to notch the tubes what I like to do is that you can hold the tube in its proper place like right next to its proper place actually just using magnets. And then uh, next what you have to do is you have to find out how much this tube will overlap on the other tube. What I do is I just take a caliper and I measure the inner radius of this tube. And then you can lock the caliper there and put the caliper on the tube. And that will tell you how high the tube has to go on this tube like in order to fit perfectly. But since this tube is already cut to length, I don't have to do that part. I know this tube is already um, overlapping at the right amount. But next what I have to do is I still need to cut these edges so that this tube can actually be fitted in between these two tubes. And the way I like to mark that is that if you just look at everything from a perpendicular view, you can take your marker and you can mark this point where you see these tubes like intersecting and then do the same thing for these two tubes mark the center of the tube too because uh, that's your other reference and then once you have these uh, points all you have to do is you have to draw a straight line from this point to that other mark that marks the center of the tube just try to make like a line as straight as possible so I had to fix my lines a little off camera because I couldn't see too well what I was drawing but anyways yeah this is what it will look like once you um, draw it perfectly and looking at it from this view you can see what it looks like. 
Um, and next what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put this tube in the chop saw and I'm going to cut this angle and I'm going to cut this angle. And then hopefully I'll end up with a tube that will fit into this part perfectly. So as it turned out these angles were too sharp to cut on a chop saw so I still had to use a plasma cutter to cut them. And after the cutting is done, here's what it looks like. And you can see that it fits in its place. I did have to fix the shape just a little bit like from here using an angle grinder. It doesn't fit as well as the ones that I um, cut from the software using the template but still it's good enough like um, this gap is not big enough, it can easily be filled by when I weld it. After that I had to do the same thing again for this cross member that goes at the back, so I just held it in place by two magnets and then marked the places where I had to notch them. And this time I did do a better job of notching the tube, so it was a pretty exact fit. I guess I got more practice as I went along. And after that I just had to weld everything. The welds got a little difficult, that's why I had to flip the chassis over a few times to uh, cover the tube from all sides. So now I'm done with welding one of the tubes off the cross member, so now I've welded that tube in place and I've also welded that one in place. And um, the part that I'm left with now is this other tube off the cross members. And the tricky part about this one is that, well I have to cut this into two different segments for this tube to fit into this one, but it still has to um, align like a perfectly straight tube. So the thing that was different about notching this tube was that I also had to notch the center part because obviously there had to be a tube going through the center of this one. So yeah, that's just to divide this tube into two segments so that both of them can go on either side of that tube. Um, but still the alignment needs to be really exact and it's pretty difficult to get this right. The only way I find to do this accurately is to notch the tubes slightly longer initially and then trim them down with an angle grinder to their final shape. Um, that way you can get it really exact and you can get the alignment perfectly right so the tubes are perfectly straight. It does take a really long time that way but at least you get the tubes really straight if you get this right. Now I'm done with making all these cross members and it took a lot of effort making these cross members because well it was really difficult aligning them extremely straight but I think I have done a good job at it because if you look at it you can't even um, tell the slightest difference by looking at it so that's pretty good. But yeah the next step now is to make the um, rollover bar that's gonna go at the back and the front hoop that's gonna go at the front. And going over some of the requirements for the rollover bar, well the requirements for open top cars at least say that um, the head of the driver should be below this uh, imaginary line. So if you draw an imaginary line going from the front hoop to the rollover bar, you, the helmet of the driver should be below this line and it should be two inches below the rollover bar. It also has to be six inches within the rollover bar so like the driver can't be sitting too far from this and also there are supposed to be these braces at the back that are not supposed to be any more than a um, 30 degrees angle of they can't be like less than 30 degrees this way i am going to make rear braces later on they are in the design but um it's not in this design right now because this design doesn't have the rear section that's going to go on for the rear suspension and everything i'm going to make that way later when i start work on the rear suspension but yeah this uh, design does meet all the requirements the only thing is that i will have to leave the seating position fixed and i will have to make the steering wheel and the pedals adjustable because the problem is that if i make the seats adjustable in this car it could be that when someone else drives the car and he adjusts the seats like forwards or backwards they might not meet these requirements so because of that i'm leaving the seats fixed and the pedals and the steering wheel is going to be adjustable instead for making the rollover bar and the front hoop i'm going to be using these two tubes for bending this tube properly to make the rollover bar what i've done is that i've marked it on the places i have to bend it because i already know from the design how wide um, the rollover bar has to be and i also know that these sides have to be bent at 65 degrees so what i'll do is that i'll add a 65 degree bend over here and a 65 degree bend over here and hope that everything lines up and my tube bender doesn't screw up because if I screw up on this um, then I'll have to start all over again there's no way to fix a tube if you bend it too much so as stupid as I am I managed to screw up on the rollover bar the bend was right everything was right but the problem was I bent it at the wrong point and now there's not enough tube left over over here to make the other bend and uh, make this long enough to fit um, and because I ordered one of each tube, that means that I'll have to scrap this one and wait to order a new one. Um, so yeah, that's going to take a while. For now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get the front hoop right, at least for now, so um, I can get the rest of the chassis done. And for this one, I'll have to wait longer to order another tube and then um, hopefully get it right that time and not screw up again. On the plus side, I did manage to get the front hoop right the first time. And this is what it looked like after it was done. And then after that I just had to notch the ends and um, weld it on the chassis. I just held it in place, just initially tack welding it in place and then I got the angle right using a digital protractor. And then I just had to add these braces at the front to support the front hoop. And also one transverse brace to prevent lateral distortion of the front hoop in case the car actually does roll over. So it's a few days later and I managed to get another tube for the rollover bar at the back. And this time I've marked everything on the tube, how much I have to bend it, where I have to bend it, and where I have to put it in the tube bender. 
Um, so hopefully I'll get it right this time, and I did the same thing for the other bend. Um, so yeah, let's hope I get it right this time, and this is pretty much going to be the last part of the chassis. At this time, I did manage to bend the tube properly, and after that it was just a matter of notching the tube and then putting it in place. And once the rollover hoop was in place, I just put these two other supports on the side, and that was pretty much it. So I guess I'll call it a day over here. The chassis is pretty much complete. I am left with some welding and there's a few braces that are still missing. You can probably tell like by looking at the design, well, one, the most obvious one is probably this one. The reason I haven't put that one in right now is because, well, this is a bit of a temporary design. This is not the final design. Uh, the final design I have to figure out after I take the rear differential out and finalize the rear suspension and everything. Um, because the rear differential is going to be mounted on the braces that are going to be coming at the back of this part. Um, so that's why I really need to figure out the placement of the rear differential and the bolting points for the rear differential before I make that part but I do need at least one transverse brace for the rollover bar for sure that's by requirement every car has to have that it's so that if the car flips over the um, rollover bar doesn't just flop towards the side and it actually is um, supported in place the only other braces missing are there's one brace over here that is going to go like from this side of the chassis to that side of the chassis that's where the steering column is going to be mounted and the reason I haven't put that in is because I need to figure out the placement for the steering column before I put that in and other than that there's some few thinner braces that I'm going to add like there's going to be one brace going from uh, that corner to that corner those are going to be thinner one inch braces and I'm also going to add those braces on the front like um, where this engine is going to mount where the engine mounts are going to be to basically support all the areas of the chassis that are not supported right now but yeah other than those few minor things this is pretty much the final chassis and the next part is going to be about making a few custom transmission mounts and engine mounts and putting that engine and transmission on this chassis um, that's going to be a pretty amazing part because well this chassis is not even like one fifth the weight of that engine it's pretty light like I'm not sure how to show you the weight but you pretty much just lift this by one hand it literally weighs nothing at all uh, so yeah I can't even wait to see the combination of like putting that massive engine on this chassis and I'm um, seeing what type of car this turns into so yeah this is definitely gonna be an extremely light car that's for sure but yeah stay tuned for the next part where more of this car starts taking shape because once the engine and the transmission are in the chassis then I'm going to be uh, making the part that's going to go in front of this chassis and that part is going to bolt onto these um, tubes over here that's why I've left these tubes open for now I am going to be um, cutting them down slightly and adding bolting points over here um, but that's all to come for the parts later this is everything for now thanks a lot for watching and hopefully see you guys in the next one